To mark International Women's Day today, we're very pleased to welcome Devina Mera, Chairperson and Global Strategist, First Global, joining us via Skype link from Dubai. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, you know, I have to say that I enjoy uh, capitalizing on the opportunity to celebrate women every day of the year, but certainly on International Women's Day, it makes double sense. I'm going to get up, uh, straight to it. Uh, and I don't know if there is a gender element to it, but what, uh, Devina, are the guiding principles for you when you invest? See, there is no gender principle to it, but still I would like to just mention uh, one, one or two important things which are not specific to my investing philosophy, but which are more about uh, how uh, women often go about investing. Uh, and the two things, one is that as a woman, you must, like men do, start saving and investing early. Do not assume that your financial well-being uh, will be taken care of by somebody else. And number two, which is something which studies have also shown that very often uh, men actually make more mistakes and yet are more confident about their abilities, where it's the reverse with women who are sometimes too cautious and uh, not really confident of their abilities. So do your homework, but then go out and make the decisions for your own financial well-being. So that's the advice that you'd give to uh, women investors. Start earlier, take your cue from men, be smart, do your homework, but don't be overly cautious. And I'm paraphrasing liberally here, Devina. But I do want to also ask you, um, you know, when you sort of look at your own investing uh, principles or mantras, what are some of the cornerstones of your approach? See, I mean, I started off as a purely fundamental investor, which meant, you know, all the conventional things of looking at not just profits, which is, you know, where a lot of people get stuck, but looking at really cash flows and looking at uh, return on equity, return on capital employed. So those were, you know, sort of starting points. And uh, often, you know, by focusing too much on EPS or earnings, people miss out on turning points there. I remember in Amazon you know, about 16 years back, the uh, first quarter where they actually had uh, turned a positive cash flow, uh, almost the whole of Wall Street turned negative on the stock saying it has no future. So those are the things that you have to look at from the fundamental point of view. But also over time, I have uh, gotten to understand that you know purely fundamental analysis also is not good enough because you have to have an overlay of uh, momentum and uh, technical analysis on top of that, which again you you know not at the superficial level but at a much deeper level. And the other thing is that sometimes uh, you have to remember in investing that the best returns come not from very very you know quote unquote good stocks or good companies which already have. Uh, very good cash flows or return ratios because often that's very much priced into their uh, stock price and that's uh, true of India more than probably any other country or any other market but oftentimes the real uh, uh, big uh, returns come from where the company is turning around now that might be as I said that you know cash flows which are negative have turned positive it might be a turn in a in the cycle for that industry it might come even like in today's context from a debt restructuring, which, you know, where, where there is some amount of business turnaround, but there's also uh, uh, there is debt restructuring, which reduces the debt. And suddenly, you know, the financials of the company start to look very, very different. Very often, in a, for example, in a commodity or a cyclical industry, your biggest returns will come not from the best companies in the industry, but which was a you know, what was a dog stock when the industry was in a downturn, but now you know two, three, four quarters of good earnings, some debt gets restructured, some of it gets repaid. Suddenly the stock price starts to look better. There are more fund raising options, so you know that's where you will get the big multi baggers. Okay, you know, and I know that my questions will sound a shade repetitive to you, but you we talked about, you know, some thoughts you had to share with retail women investors. And I'm going to stick with the women theme just for a moment longer. When it comes to women professional money managers, 
Is there anything that you've learned that you'd like to share today? Some advice again for them? Professional women money think, managers. I, no, I don't think that's a very, very, you know, uh, gender specific uh, kind of uh, job or the way you should go about it. And the only thing I would like to say is that in the past, whether in academics or in the professional life, you know, every achievement that came and in the beginning of my career, I thought, why should it be celebrated as a woman's achievement? After all, I mean, the uh, the playing field is the same for everybody. But uh, over time, as I have become older and I <laughs> dare say wiser, I have understood that it is important to have the role models that it should be that whether it is in science or whether it is in investing that uh, for younger uh, girls and women to feel that yes, I can also do it. So that is important. And uh, uh, as far as the professional money managers are concerned, unfortunately, this is then a job where your numbers speak for themselves. So this is, in a sense, a much more level playing field than many others where you can, you know, the results are there comparable for men and women, and there is very little extra overlay on top of that. Fair enough. And I totally appreciate sort of uh, uh, the um, evolution of your philosophy when it comes to celebrating women and their achievements, because I feel like that uh, as I grow older too, that, uh, you know, marking the role models is actually fairly important. With your permission, Devi, I'd like to touch upon a couple of other topics because we don't often get the chance. And the primary one is the election outcome this weekend. How significant, in your opinion, is it for the markets here on? I think the more important thing is that it's probably significant for the country. I mean, I don't think the markets are that very important. And uh, I would not like to speculate on what the outcome would be. But ultimately, I don't think, you know, it's going to have a very lasting impact on the market just as of, you know, it might have a one day, two day, one week impact. But I don't think that's going to be the determinant of uh, where the market goes. Okay. Uh let me ask you to reflect a little bit on what we've seen as far as quarterly earnings in the third quarter are concerned and the demonetization impact as well. And there's a bit of a debate out here about whether or not to accept the GDP numbers that have come from the CSO at face value about how prolonged the demonetization lingering effects could be. Your thoughts would be invaluable. How are you reading the whole situation? See, I do not have a better estimate than what the CSO has put out, but you know there are a couple of uh, caveats to keep in mind when you're looking at the CSO numbers, and one of them is that uh, these primarily look at the larger, uh, you know, manufacturing or uh, service units, which means you know mostly the uh, large organized sector units and the numbers for the informal sector for the smaller units etc come in much later so you're really extrapolating from the organized sector so that is one part of it because the impact of the demonetization was much more on the informal and smaller uh, units and the other thing is that for uh, uh, if you look at also in terms of the larger units themselves there uh, a lot of channel stuffing happened during these three months because basically what was happening was that you were looking at you know, production, just uh, uh, the company still producing, but that going on to the dealers and wholesalers, and uh, but not really maybe getting sold. So that impact will again come probably in the next quarter. So that those are the two important things to keep in mind. And also, you know, because some of the numbers do seem a bit strange, like, for example, that our consumer sentiment has been declining very sharply, and yet you see a very big increase in personal consumption, which, which doesn't seem to sit right. So, as I said, one, one thing could be that you're extrapolating from production, and that could be because you're not, you don't really have the actual data for consumption. And okay. that could be, again, skewed by the larger units doing channel stuffing. Okay. Uh, Devina, uh, hold on. Uh We'd uh, like to also introduce Amisha Vora, Joint Managing Director, Prabhudas Leeladhar Group as well, onto the show this afternoon. And uh, as I said, Amisha, we're marking International Women's Day with uh, ace women investors. So at the outset, many thanks for making the time to both of you. I'll ask a couple of questions that I just put to uh, Devina when we started of our conversation. Uh, what are your guiding principles uh, for investing? 
And to what extent is there a gender-specific element to it? Hi, uh, thank you for inviting me on uh, International Women's Day. And I would like to wish you, as well as all the viewers, and particularly women viewers, uh, happy International Women's Day. Uh, of course, coming back to investing, I think, uh, you know, as we feel that market world over and over here also chases growth. So growth is an important uh, criteria while selecting stocks. And a lot of things go behind it in terms of how sustainable is the growth, how uh, well governed is the growth, uh, and how well priced is the growth. Then these three aspects, finally a judgment on that leads you to arrive at the stock that you want to uh, recommend or you want to hold in your own portfolio. Okay, there are two uh, subparts to my next question. One is for, uh, you know, retail women investors. Uh, Devina was talking about how they sometimes start a bit late. Also, that they, women tend to be cautious, and she was referring to studies on that front. Uh, the other piece is just women in the profession, women like you who are starting out, uh, you know, figuring out, how to navigate the territory. Advice for both sets of women. What would you say, Amisha? I would uh, put it like this, that, uh, you know, whether it is men or women, uh, starting out in the world of investments or trading, because these are slightly two different aspects within the markets, needs a little bit of homework and needs a little bit of discipline, maybe differently. So like in no other activity without investments of either time or developing a little skill, you can't make anything. One must understand that here also that basic rule applies. That is how you remain away from pure speculation and also avoid the risk on your capital or reduce the risk on your capital. Having said that, I think that uh, women probably can do a much better job on this than men because men any which way is very busy with creation of that regular income. So a lot of women who are not professional in the field but can develop a niche in terms of learning, reading, skill development and can contribute to family's wealth creation. Like I told Devina, I can't uh, you know, let this opportunity slip. Got to talk about some things that uh, the market is keeping track of. And Amisha, uh, I guess the most important one, Devina corrected me and she said it's not just important for the markets, it's important for the nation as well. Uh, the election outcome this weekend, uh, the correlation between that outcome and where the markets go thereafter, how strong, how prolonged do you think it could be? I think that the markets till now also have shown tremendous resilience and uh, the election outcome uh, if positive, will lead to so many deductions, including the, you know, strength increase in Rajya Sabha. And because of which, I think it will help propel market to cross that very critical 9,000 level if the outcome is, you know, hugely successful. And if otherwise, I think that it will also probability is there that it can set in a mild correction. I'm not expecting a very deep correction, but a mild correction is not ruled out. A mild correction if there's a negative outcome for the BJP and uh, crossing the 9,000 mark if it's a successful outcome for the BJP. I hope I've paraphrased correctly, Amisha. Absolutely. Okay. And, and now I'm just bringing both of you up to speed in our conversation. Uh, Amisha, you know, the markets will go where they have to go, keeping in mind politics, also keeping in mind corporate performance. And we've got the Q3 scorecard. We've got GDP numbers from the CSO. Um, we've got, you know, real economy indicators. And they're not fitting in perfectly right now. So do you think that based on how the fit plays out in Q4, in the next financial year, particularly the start of the next financial year, there is actually, uh, you know, room for caution going forward? 
I would think that you know mild corrections and uh, some volatility is part and parcel of the market's uh, journey for a uh, next level but the way earnings are depressed for one or other reasons for last three years and the way that uh, you know macro is at the moment be it fiscal deficit be it interest rate outlook and interest rate and be it liquidity position the chances of next three years showing much better earnings growth than last three years are very high of course in the process there are fed rate hikes and there are xyz so many reasons but i would still think that the chances of market with mild correction and little volatility giving good returns are better even from now devina so in short markets are buy at declines across okay so it's a buy at declines as far as amisha's outlook for the markets is concerned devina i did want you to reflect a little bit on a bunch of global factors us protectionism uh the fed um chair janet yellen talking about you know in a sense preparing the market for a rate hike uh inflation showing signs of picking up in europe so monetary tightening on the cards there as well net net the global factors and how they affect indian equities again what's your analysis uh there see the direct factor more than the protectionism in the us would impact indian it to an extent but more than that i think for indian it the big risk is the whole change in business model with the move to the cloud etc and how they adapt to it and whether you know that would still require the kind of resources in terms of human resources and others that they have built up so for them the business while h1b etc is part of the risk but i think the more direct risk for indian it is really being able to Uh, uh restructure their business model in the new environment and that's you know on pharma again there is like more than protectionism they've had the regulatory issues in which you know some of it at least appear well deserved so how again they are able to change that and whether they are again able to go back to that uh, premier uh, global uh, positioning in pharma those are the two industries which are you know most directly affected and uh, you know inflation in europe etc ultimately will not impact india so directly so you know uh, that's broadly if you look at india versus the global markets we think it will be about market perform not uh, going to outperform uh, either in the global markets or emerging markets tremendously and in, within india as we've said for quite a long time really uh you have to focus more on the small and medium caps and that's been our call for the you know last year and a half two years and that still remains within large caps there are areas especially commodities which look interesting which you know which have performed well and we think that some of those will continue to perform well whether it is metal or oil okay but if you had fresh money to deploy today devina where would you put it you're talking india specifically yes india or and yeah so as i said that you know fresh money to deploy still would be uh, uh small and medium caps but it would be again you have to those are areas where you cannot go broadly by sectors or you know do very broad stroke analysis you really have to go company by company and do some in depth analysis in order to analyze that in as i said in terms of the large caps uh, we we think commodities would still continue to outperform which is steel metals oil there are some other areas you know two wheelers we have like we now we have to see how much this demonetization effect continues but that still looks interesting parts of chemical and infrastructure it's also look interesting okay amisha same question to you i mean uh, you know for 2017 uh, what are the most promising investment themes I think within the very large uh, space, banking, finance, uh, insurance, uh, mutual funds, and NBFC. So within the banking and finance, the whole gamut of stocks are available. I believe that will continue to do reasonably okay. And within that, largely because we think that the amount of pain in terms of asset quality, pain across the industry. uh as it is reducing be it you know sugar textile steel some other auto ancillary parts one by one for so many different reasons 
the pain on the banks and uh, balance sheet can also come down. Uh, having said that, of course, there will be some resolutions, there will be delays and that will keep keeping little volatility. But this sector will continue to be uh, a sector to look at and pick and choose stocks within that for sure. And the second uh, thing theme to look at will be, uh, you know, the GST will give a lot of unorganized to organized kind of a shift. And uh, some of the industry which is facing huge unorganized sector competition, uh, I think will start finding level playing field, be it plywood industry, be it some of the auto ancillary and replacement industry. So uh, select, uh, pick and choose within that will also work. The third theme which we have been working not for this year but on a slightly longer term period is the diagnostic industry where we think that the more and more uh, care will come instead of just the cure and the diagnostic industry will have a much better future. I am sure there are many but these are some of the three top which I which comes to my mind. Well I have to say between Devina and Amisha we've got a large chunk of uh, the market covered. Uh, uh, you know, we really appreciate your time here on NDTV and I have to say I'm always tempted to really make this a one hour long conversation, but I know you have time constraints, certainly. So one parting shot from you, Devina, watch out for, complete that sentence when it comes to equities in India in 2017. Still the small and medium caps. Okay. Amisha, same, uh, uh, same sentence to you, watch out for dot 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 in 2017 when it comes to Indian equities there could be a positive surprise around the corner how would you fill that sentence up watch out for I would say that uh, within this uh, good markets a lot of mid cap small cap uh, I would say not good quality is started trading at very high valuations one should be extremely cautious on that okay and I'll add my own watch out for I'll say Watch out for women. Uh, the, you know, gathering uh, steam, momentum, pace and success faster than you imagine. Devina, Amisha, many, many thanks for your time. Look forward to speaking more frequently where we can look at various aspects of the market in greater detail. Good talking to you on International Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.